Okay, uh, well, we have our final speaker of the day. Uh, and of all the people, all the distinguished speakers that we've had this afternoon, Dr. Washington probably needs the least, but deserves the longest of, of introductions. And frankly, I did prepare a long introduction, but you've done such a great job of that over the course of the day. Um, and I think we're all anxious to hear what uh, Dr. Washington has to say. So rather than take up any more time, um, I'm going to invite him up and, and hear the story uh, from Penn State to climate modeling to science policy. Dr. Washington. take the, uh, go through my talk to see if there's some, some gaps that I might want to uh, you know, say about my career, what I plan to do in the future. Um, before I get started on that, uh, let me just say that Mary and, and I are planning on leaving a scholarship to students uh, here at the university. We're doing the same thing at the AMS, so we're going to do the same thing at Oregon State over the years. So that's another way of, of leaving a legacy is to help out those in the future. So let me turn the slides. Einstein's statue at the National Academy of Sciences and uh, engineering. And it came about that uh, in, in, I think it was 2009, I was asked by uh, an organization called the History Makers, which is about uh, leaving uh, a legacy of videotapes about African Americans in all fields and all disciplines and so forth. <clears throat> and the, the leader of it talked Al Gore into writing a very beautiful uh, in, the introduction to a PBS show called A Night with More in Washington. And I uh, was being interviewed by the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Ralph Cicero. Unfortunately, died just a few years ago. <clears throat> and it really started with my childhood. We went into deep discussion of my education and so forth, and how I was motivated by the pioneers that go back for a long period of time. <clears throat> so, we took that picture outside of the Academy building and it showed uh, two of us on, the, uh, on both sides of Einstein. I'll come back to Einstein in a minute because we really have a connection. I thought I would talk about that a little bit. Uh, anyway, so I'll explain you what I can. If you're interested in seeing this, you can go to YouTube. Search on the night with Warren Washington, you'll find it. Next slide. Early steps in my career. Uh, I will say something about how I came to Penn State. It wasn't clear, I think, in either my autobiography. I would just add a few more things to it. Uh, <clears throat> I, I went to Oregon State from 1954 to, to 1958. Started working on a master's in 59, uh, well, from the end of 58. And then I graduated in, 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 in 
1960 in Kent State, but before coming in the summer of 1959, I got a, uh, a job offer from Stanford to work as a mathematician on a small project by uh, a couple of scientists who were interested in building an atmospheric model. And actually, on uh, my summer experience in, in 59 at Stanford, uh, kind of taught me, or at least kind of led to me thinking about going to graduate school for PhD. And they advised me to come to uh, to uh, Penn State and some other schools, which I applied to. As Eric pointed out, I got a photograph back request from Florida State, where they didn't seem to want many African American students, I guess, at that time. Well, <coughs> at the end, I worked on this project, and I had some extra time, and they had, and they were also working on how to, how uh, energy is propagated by hydrogen bombs under different kinds of, of soil and and uh, land areas that, based upon the material. So I solved not only. Uh, the equations of motion for the atmosphere, but also bomb blasts in various parts of the world. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't have a classified so, so, so security clearance, but I assumed that somebody must not have thought I could figure out what those equations meant. But I was just supposed to solve them. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good e e e experience, but it really did prepare me for the next step, and that was to start using computers. Uh, Oregon State had a computer called the AllWAC, which was the, a, a successor to the ENIAC computer uh, of the late 1950s. <clears throat> and after my, uh, I finished working for that summer, I went to a conference in Eugene, Oregon, and I met uh, with Joe Charney. That was my first experience. I spoke before he did on mountain waves and the theory of mountain waves under certain conditions, which I won't bore you with. And, and Joe said to me, gee, why don't you come to MIT? And I said, well, I don't know. But anyway, I, I listened to his talk, and we, that's when we first met. So uh, I ended up at Penn State on a project called <clears throat> Objective, an Objective Analysis as a graduate assistant. My salary was $200 a month. Ninety of that went to my apartment. I was married at the time, and we and we had a small child, but we made it. It was uh, a little bit difficult, and I uh, and, and the project involved objective analysis, and it turned out that Panofsky was interested in this subject. If you look at the, the old uh, 1950s AMS compendium, there's a chapter in there by Jules Charney, and he made reference to you know, the need for an objective analysis scheme, and he turned to Hans Panofsky to, to come up with some ideas. Because the problem was on the weather stations were in odd spot places based upon criteria much different than a regular grid. So Hans came up with the idea of using uh, a 4A analysis in the x direction and in the y direction. 
but he didn't have a way to, to figure out on the coefficients. Well, when I came to Penn State to work on this project, I, I quickly learned that there was nobody there that was terribly interested in carrying this further. I mean, Hans Panofsky uh, had, had gone on to boundary layer and turbulence theory, and, and Bob Duquette, who you saw, saw a picture of this morning, really was interested in computers. And so, not only was I a student working on this pro proposal that was funded by the Air Force, but I was also the PI. Uh, so I had to learn how to write quarterly reports to keep the, the uh, people happy in the Air Force that were funding it. And I, I tackled the problem somewhat differently. I said, sort of, when should you be able to, to real, re rely upon temperature or geopotential or on vorticity? Turns out that the theory of, of, uh, of how to make the equations in balance when you started to make a forecast had to not have big discrepancies. And then I published a paper on this on the first year of, of ending my, paper, my thesis work in TELUS magazine. Actually, it was picked up by a lot of people who were interested in, in should you trust the winds or should you trust uh, on the temperatures, and I think we came up with a theoretical understanding of that. So anyway, I got off to a good start, I think, in my work. Um, turns out that for, for those that didn't sort of know it, Hans became my thesis advisor on a more constant basis. Hans and his brother, who was a physicist, grew up in, in, at the Institute of, of Advanced Study in Princeton. And their father was the preeminent art historian in the world. And Einstein invited him to come over and avoid what was happening with the Holocaust issue in Germany. So he was... Uh, he was uh, highly regarded. Turns out that Einstein uh, had a great deal of affection for his father in terms of friendship, but neither one of them liked to drive cars. So Hans and his brother spent on their, ch on their teenage years driving both of them around or individually in their in Einstein's car. <laughs> so uh, I, I asked Einstein if, if uh, I, I didn't see him, I didn't ask Einstein. I asked uh, Hans's brother if he did most of the driving. He said no. Uh, uh, he did a lot of the driving, but they n never agreed about who would do what, so they took turns taking, taking Einstein around, as well as his father. Uh, let's see, so, it, 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 it turns out, and I'm writing another book on the, on the fundamentals of, of what the equations that we solve comes from, and it really turns out that for the radiation part, Einstein had a major role of, of, of telling us on what would happen when a photon hits metal or hits some subject, and how it gets captured. And so it actually leads to, let me skip this. John Tyndall. Now you 
you've heard of John Tyndall. But I think if, we, if you have to give credit to somebody to figure out what was going on in, in 1861, it's really John Tyndall who started us understanding. Because if you calculated the amount of energy that comes from the sun, and then you assume that the atmosphere is transparent for the, in the in, infrared part of the spectrum, then you come out with a temperature that is way too cold for to explain how the temperature of the surface comes out. What John Tendall did was he put in this in this uh, simple apparatus on the on the right. He he put in just ordinary air, and he found as the Bunsen the Bunsen burner on the left sends infrared radiation to a de detector on the right, and uh, he found that the infrared radiation didn't get through. It was absorbed and re-emitted. And if you put that factor in there, then you come out with the right temperature of the, of the calculations of the energy balance of your surface. Up until then, nobody had, had an idea of, of, of how the Earth's radiation was balanced uh, by, by greenhouse gases. So John Tendall extended these experiments. He put in individual things of, of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, and pinned down that it was carbon dioxide for the concentrations it was at is the major factor. He didn't understand what was really going on in the in how the infrared radiation was absorbed, on that came later. John Tendall then traveled around, he was at Cambridge in England, but he traveled to Switzerland, the US, gave talks explaining how this works in, in a basic sense, and really established the greenhouse gases and stabilize the climate system. And so I like to give him a lot of credit. These gentlemen on the, on the top right is B. Bjorkness, who essentially wrote the first papers on the equations of motion. Uh, the guy in the middle is L. F. Richardson, who uh, who was uh, against wars in World War I, and he spent uh, his time there uh, as an ambulance driver. He didn't want to take part in the battles in, the, in France with the Germans. Now, he, he had extra hands, extra time on their hands, because in the early days, on the, on the, they were in trenches, so there wasn't a lot of fighting going on, and then suddenly there would be episodes of fighting. So he actually solved these equations for one location in France, and actually showed them the way to solve these equations, although his forecast was pretty lousy because of the interact, the, uh, the uh, accuracy of the data he put in for the winds wasn't, wasn't very good. The importance to, to on what I did with Dr. Casar in the early 70s, 60s, was we solved the same set of equations and got a reasonable simulation. should say, in the future, um, uh, you're seeing
seen through the various grids here. The grid that seems to be still in between two choices on the, on the left hand side is a latitude longitude grid that has a problem of, of, of too much resolution right near the pole, the north and south pole. The grid on the right is called the cubic sphere grid. It's much like a soccer ball where you have a, a cube where you transform the, the spherical grid structure to a six-sided cube. Each cube side is identical, so you can, you can solve each, you know, each case on modern computers in a way that you look at each, each side and carry out the calculations. This is what our, our grid system looks like in most of our the versions of our models. And also in our new models, we can just flip a switch and switch grid systems from one system to another, depending on what kind of problem that you're using. I won't go into the vegetation and the land surface, but we try to incorporate all of the things that are important, the role of vegetation, whether you have deciduous trees or non-deciduous green, evergreen type trees, and all kinds of, of, of variations in the earth's surface, even things like the shielding of the land by river, by tree leaves. When winter comes, the leaves fall off the trees, Radiation gets adjusted at the surface and so forth and so on. So all of these features are, are, are very common in state-of-the-art uh, climate models. On this show is El Ninos and La Ninos on the red lines and the middle graphs are El Ninos observations and, and, and model. We do a pretty good job of simulating the frequency and the intensity of El Nino's in our model. I'll show okay, This is our first model. It's a two-level model. So this was 1966 or so, and we started our atmosphere out very cold, and we heated up the, we put in realistic ocean temperatures. And you can see high, high pressure over land and low pressure over oceans. And in five days, we warmed up the system. And then after 10 days, we start to form baroclinic waves. And the, the simple sort of Hadley-type circulations, or sea degrees-type circulations, breaks down into baroclinic waves. The temperature's at the bottom, and the sea level pressure is at the top. And so this gave us hope that we were on the right path. Yeah, it's working fine. I might point out that we got a visitor one day a 90-year-old man he came to visit us. His name is Richard Courant of the Courant Frederick Lee. He's a famous mathematician, applied mathematician. And we sat him down to a chair and he, he watched this movie and he said, he jumped up about halfway through it and said, I want to be a meteorologist. <laughs> And I change. <laughs> Actually, I spent time at his at his uh, uh, 
Institute at NYU when, because I, there were times I needed computer time. We didn't have a big computer here at Penn State. So I took the train to New York and, and they had the, 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 the first 7090 computer and they, they, they let me use it. And they had a very nice feature I would recommend it for uh, things at four o'clock every day they would have tea in a special room on the top floor where it's nothing but blackboards. And the faculty and the students would come there and they would just argue about all kinds of things. And I remember um, visiting with, with um, Peter Lax. Peter was an outstanding mathematician and he helped run the, the institute. And I, I went into his office one day and I said, I said, why do you have five desks? He says, I'm working on physics, optics problems, astronomy problems. I'm working on some, some calculations dealing with biology. And he wanted to keep his papers separate, so he just sat down at different, different desks. I ran into Peter many, many years later, and he also got the National Medal of Science and was a very outstanding mathematician. In fact, uh, Kruin found him in high school and sent him directly to graduate school. And he did well. <laughs> This is going to show a present-day climate model. I made this a year or so ago. And it shows two, two kinds of patterns, one for the present climate and one for the, for, for the future climate of, of year 2100, if we don't do anything about climate change. So this is two extremes. See that when we go down to a quarter of a degree globally, that we capture hurricanes and tropical storms, and they're more prevalent. It'll come on in just a second. What you'll be seeing is, is the, something that we call in meteorology a precipitable water. It's the total amount of water vapor in the vertical. And I hope you guys can see it fairly well. The first thing that you see is we have a warmer ocean and we have more water vapor in the atmosphere from the evaporation. And you can see the tropical storms forming uh, even uh, in, in March. And on the months that are going by at the top, top right, you can see the calendar. And you'll be seeing as we get into the summer months, um, more tropical storms and hurricanes in the, in the, the, the northern hemisphere. Now, the, the redder areas are higher amounts. You can see in the future climates, you see much more water vapor. And, and, and the hurricanes actually have, in many of them, open centers at this resolution. And this is reassuring. This is just showing resolution. It, will help you get tropical storms and hurricanes in global models. And even though I don't show you the, all the figures, but if you, if you, on higher velocity hurricanes, there's more prevalent hurricanes uh, in the at the end of the century if we don't do anything about climate change. I think
think this is a game. Many scientists are running and looking at these sort of results and seeing that this is a major problem for us. You can click on the next slide. Here I'm going to show uh, a Resolution. So this is using one tenth of a degree grid. You see the eddies along the equator, and up near Japan, you see the Kuroshio current, and over on the, on the east side of the U.S. and Canada, you see the Gulf Stream. And by, by going to a higher resolution and better physics. Our ocean circulation is going to be very realistic in terms of the Gulf Stream eddies and the, and the Gulf Stream itself in various parts of the world. So we're starting to run models on a, on a daily basis using such high resolution models. So, so this is just in, in addition to Bert Sentner's talk where he indicated the, the progress that we're making in the use of ocean models. So um, we have some um, several proposals in to, to couple the high resolution atmosphere and ocean models for the next round of IPCC. This is a, a, a simulation from a NASA model where you actually look at the aerosols. You see those brownish aerosols uh, in, coming off of the Sahara Desert, bringing the, uh, dust all the way over to the Western Caribbean area. On the, on the white ones above those, uh, are carbon dioxide. And you can see that the, there's plumes that go off from Canada, China. And you see a very, very large amounts of carbon dioxide being put in from uh, the burning of fossil fuels. On the green areas are, are, are biomass burning. And at the very bottom are, uh, are aerosols from sea spray. So, as you can imagine, in the newer versions of models, we're coupling the chemistry and the aerosols directly now, instead of specifying those. So, it's going to lead to a lot of difficulty because we don't have good verification from satellites of the aerosol concentrations. Uh, but I think it's coming in the next generation of satellites where, where we'll have some good st st statistics in terms of uh, global coverage. So I just want to mention this is the part of the future of climate modeling. I think uh, there have been several talks this morning showing the different levels that we want to achieve in terms of uh, changes of atmospheric temperature. The red line essentially shows we don't do anything at all about carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. 
on the, on the ones on the right, the green and the blue, uh, are us hoping that we can keep things to either a 2%, only 2 degree temperature change, or a 3 degree temperature change. I, I'm worried that with the, the present policies of the of the, the Trump administration that we're not going to you know, get there as quickly as possible. But, but we'll just have to keep working on on the, on the various aspects of, of getting s society to do something about it. Uh, it's not clear to me on what we would get, actually get in terms of if we follow the, the Paris Accords it would be somewhere in the, in the two or three degree range, I think. But we have a target. And you can see who's actually doing the, the most carbon dioxide. China at the top, U.S. is second, Russia third, India fourth, Japan the fifth, and so forth. So um, I think that the various uh, top five or six countries have special priority to get their acts into gear to, to decrease on the, on the emissions. As I said last night, we're off to a bad start right now, but hopefully things will change at some point. Uh, let me skip that. I'm uh, taking this from the National Climate Assessment thing that I mentioned last night. This is what we hope to give back to the city planners, state planners, and the federal planners as to what kind of information we can give about climate change. The most crucial ones, of course, are the, are the temperature changes, the moisture changes, the, the, the change of sea level, are things that we can give useful information already. And by doing another IPCC, we're not going to probably change the facts. We're just going to have better air bounds of what the facts are, so that we keep keep the policymakers aware that nothing's going to probably change, and that they should actually start to take steps rather than waiting for the next IPCC assessment. I just like to show this figure that was in the New York Times, essentially showing that. Natural disasters, which includes fires, uh, uh, floods, and tropical storms, cost the federal government $300 billion last year. And it's likely to keep on going up to higher numbers as we get more and more di disasters. I don't think that the I don't think that, that people can ignore this because there is a real cost in, and we can track this number down. This does not include private aspects, so this number could be a factor of two under what it really costs to uh, deal with, with natural disasters. Let me skip that showed that uh, earlier figure, they're the, the people that are going to be affected on the most. Uh, here I just want to show that the uh, nearly half of the Americans are sure global warming is happening and it's going up to roughly 70%. So I think that's very good. 
Now, I have worked with, uh, I've served on many advisory things for the presidents. I want to point it out, when I started, uh, for, for Jimmy Carter, I worked on fishing issues because we were uh, losing the fishing in, in, in the Northeast off the coast of, of New England, certain fishes fisheries were overfished, but we never really got them to stop or slow down, and what we're left with is a bad fishery in terms of certain things like cod. Uh, worked on clean air programs and law of the sea. Uh, well, one other thing I did, well, let me go on to Ronald Reagan. I helped with the Earth satellites. Uh, I was asked to testify uh, about turning the, the, the weather radars over to CONSAT along with the satellite programs. I testified I was against it. I was sitting right next to the Secretary of Commerce and he testified that he wanted to turn it, turn it over to, uh, to, to com, ComSat. And then, lightning stroke. The chairman of the hearing in the House Science C Committee opened up a piece of paper and he read it, and he said, that his assistant who was arranging this had a job offer from ComSat. And the, uh, and the wise chairman of the committee said, oh, that's unfortunate. What are you going to do about it to the Secretary of Commerce? And the Secretary of Commerce turned around and fired him on the spot and told him to leave the room. And I had some small part to say since I testified against uh, selling the satellites and the weather radars to ComSat or giving it to them to prevent them from being where people would have to pay for weather forecasts and they would have to pay for satellite information. I was, I was for a few hours Hero. So I'm glad that I did that because I really think it's, a, I'm not against the privatization in certain circumstances, but I think it's the responsibility of the government to ensure that people have free weather information and are able to uh, get the information that they need for society especially harmful uh, information, and they have to pay for it. It's just part of our taxes. Anyway, let's see. Dan Clinton, uh, Clinton oh, yeah, um, George Bush, on, on the, on the you know, senior, I uh, was asked to speak to the cabinet of the, of the George Bush administration before going into his office, uh, John Sununu uh, misquoted me in Newsweek magazine because we had a new paper coming out and it was picked up by the New York or the Newsweek. And it was the first calculation, I think Bert mentioned it in, in his discussion this morning about a fully coupled model to an atmosphere model. And we showed how things are going to warm up gradually with time. John Sununu felt that uh, uh, it would warm up the whole ocean and that would take centuries. And, and we pointed out, or tried to point out to him, that as you warm up the ocean, 
and actually gets a little thinner layer at the top where you have the warm water and the colder water underneath. Only in a few spots in around the world. It's not like that. <clears throat> where there is some deep mixing. Well, we argued about it in a white way in his office. And then he, he <laughs> Bromley was a science advisor and he was sitting with me. And, and Bromley told me, now don't get mad. He's going to ask you for something. He didn't tell me what it was until I got in the office. Then John Snow says, I want to have a copy of your ocean, your climate model, so I can run it on the uh, on my compact 386. <laughs> I told him, I said, the compact 386 just won't do it. You need a cray. I said, if you need something done, tell us what you want and we'll test it on our on our com um, computers. He said, no, I don't trust you guys. <laughs> so, and I left the office, uh, the science advisor, Bromley, said, oh, he's so busy, you don't need to take care of it. And I kind of forgot about it, and I went, went back home and went back to doing research. Then about six weeks later, Bromley calls me up and says, get him off my back. And you get him something he can run on his computer. <laughs> and he re reminded me, Trump, had, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Sununu had told me he has a Fortran compiler <laughs> installed on his computer. And anyway, we made up a simple little model where he could just change a few parameters. But I told him, I said, I said, don't talk about this too much because every credible oceanographer in the world would tell you that, it's, that all that heat's not going to go down to the bottom of the ocean. It's going to be mostly in the upper layers of the and therefore it's a thin layer, relatively thin layer, that gets heated up by 50 meters thick, something of that sort. Because you just embarrass yourself, you know. He, but he could do some experiments. And then uh, there was an article in the New York, in the New, New Yorker in this last week about the inside information about what happens in the Trump uh, or in the Bush administration is that they had an opportunity to to stop the, the burning of fossil fuels or slow it down. But I didn't see it that way. I, it, I saw it as a John Sununi was mostly a bully. And I, got, I was there witnessing it because as soon as I came out of the office, I got contacted by the head of EPA, the head of NASA, the head of NOAA, and, and could I sneak into their office and tell them what I told them uh, since uh, Nunu. And they were all very curious to know what was going on in the White House. And when I, I, also at that time, I spoke to the cabinet, and we had the head of OMB, Dick Darman, who was there listening to, to my presentation along with, along with a person from NOAA. And his name was Dan Albritt, and he's a very famous atmospheric chemist. And we were in the Roosevelt room, which is right across from the, from the, from where the White House, or the President has his office, the Oval Office. And here we were, because uh, we had, you know, being scientists, we had to show view graphs. And we had a, uh, 
cabinet officers on the floor looking for a plug for the overhead projector. Nobody knew where it was. Anyway, um, we got it on, but then the hot air was blowing directly on the head of OMB, and I said, that's not suitable. Because that has nothing to do with global warming. <laughs> <laughs> so we moved, moved things around in the room. But the two, we were in the Roosevelt room, which is uh, where most of the meetings take place in the White House. Well, at the end of it, Bromley did something very brave. He, he asked everybody in the room, all of these uh, heads of the science agencies, do you agree that we should heighten our research efforts in global change? And they all said yes. And the head of OMB was there, and he heard it. And, and that led to the U.S. Global Change Program, which right at, right at, right at that meeting. It was approved and pushed forward. Uh, Bob Carell was there and helping you know, get it set up, so, which has led to a decade or more of, of, of funding. I kind of got off track there. But anyway, we, we ended up doing the best we could to explain to the administration that this is a serious problem and has to be dealt with. I would have been happy if we would have agreed to cut back on greenhouse gases, but I don't think it was uh, something that John Sanuna was going to agree to. And he had a lot of weight to say. Okay, let me see if I can. So I think I've told you this story right here. It was quite an experience. This is Margaret Thatcher that was referred to earlier. She came and visited us. She was Prime Minister of, of the UK. And she was on her way to Aspen, Colorado to talk to Ronald Reagan. And she wanted to have a briefing. Now it turns out that she had a, a bachelor's from Oxford in organic chemistry. So she knew something about physics and, and chemistry and so forth. And so I was asked to give a briefing to her. And in order to have safety for her, her, we had uh, uh, squads of, of military people and policemen all over the in car, and we started. Uh, I went through my slides. Some of the same slides I showed you, I showed to her, and she kept asking so many questions. I wasn't able to get through my talk. So the science advisor stood up and said, it's time for us to go to the next appointment at Martin Marietta. Uh, and everyone stood up, but she pointed her finger just like she pointed there. She says, I'm not leaving here until I see every one of the... Everybody sat down. <laughs> and we finished. It took an hour and a half, better just an hour. But she asked very good questions, and she apparently had been briefed about climate change. And this was, uh, uh, you know, I think about 93, 93. I think it was 93 or so. But it was, I got a very nice letter from her, and also a picture of her uh, that she promised to, to read the several papers I gave her. I don't know whether she read them or not. <laughs> now this is uh, something from Joe Biden and, and me. Uh, we're at Colby College, where we both got honorary degrees last year. And if you read the bottom part there, which I can't read from here, it is, it's uh, Joe Biden 
made some comments about me. Can you read that? So I, I saw pictures of, of Joe Biden or some video about him last week. Uh, and I saw that he was at, he, he spoke at John McCain's funeral. And uh, I haven't been in touch with him lately, but uh, he sent me that um, just a few months ago. Oh, yeah, let me just say that uh, I was at, oops, I got a screw up here. Yeah, I spoke before a hearing with John McCain and, and, and Joe Liverman, a uh, hearing at all that the Senate had on the Hill. It turns out that these hearings, I think, Several people in this room probably have given testimony on climate change. And I enjoyed my, my time, but the, the people that actually showed up were those who were concerned. And it was a relatively small number of, of senators, uh, which is sort of disappointing because we have to get more of the, the far right Senators to, to agree to do something. I mean, just, okay, let's go to the last one. Can you do the next one? I'll turn it up. The 2009 National Medal of Science to Warren M. Washington, National Center for Atmospheric Research for its development and use of global climate models to understand climate and explain the role of human activities and natural processes in the Earth's climate system, and for his work to support a diverse science and engineering workforce. He has trouble with being over my big head. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that this, is, this was, was my second meeting with him, my first meeting, you know, was he asked me when he was a senator to be on the panel with him on climate change, and I was, except that he spoke before I did, and he apparently stole my notes. <laughs> and I complained to him in a polite way. And so when I saw him for the second time in the, in the blue room in, in the White House, because he spent 15 minutes with us, each one of us members who got the National Medal of Science. Uh, my member, in my class, there were the guy who invented super glue, which I didn't realize was used uh, by the military to stop bleeding very quickly. And the inventor of the digital camera, which each of you has on your iPhone. Or yeah, if you, if you use digital cameras. And we had a fun time after that. Because uh, we got on the, on the telephone with 100,000 students across the, the country and where they were asking us questions in the White House. Uh, and we gave them advice. I don't know how we picked out to ask questions, but it was kind of fun to, to, to sort of do that. The next slide, I think I'm all done. Oh yeah, well we have a new head of the OSCP, I think. We haven't, it hasn't been finally uh, confirmed, I don't think. Recommended to the uh the whole of the, uh, of the Senate. It, it was recommended um, to, recommended? to a vote. But, but they haven't taken a vote on it yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
I've been having a little correspondence with him. I told him that I'm willing to help, but they, uh, I didn't say anything negative about his boss. <laughs> <laughs> so if it turns out that I've traveled with Kevin to meetings in Europe, he's heard me speak many times, pretty much along the same line. So uh, he understands my views on climate change without any, any doubt. And we'll just have to see. Uh, if, obviously, I'm not going to change my principles and my feelings about climate change issues. But I will try to help, if, if we can help, the Office of Science and Technology. Okay, I think that's it. speakers, Greg, for helping put this all together. I want to thank my wife, Mary, for support over the years. And I'm honored to be honored by Penn State alumni and, and staff. So thank you very much and have good travelings back home. Bye-bye. Reception at five in the weather, the weather center. So hope to see you there. And again, thanks for coming out.